and greetings, brethren beloved. Welcome to another evening of Bible study. So very good to invite all of us to be a part. Amen. We thank God for what he has been doing, the simple things that we have been looking at as we go through the book of Genesis. We just, up to this point, have been somewhat putting things in a certain sequential manner so that we appreciate the book. We have pretty much been examining the book, surveying the book, uh, so that we can have a basic understanding of what it is about, how, how long it took to write the book of Genesis. Uh, we have looked at the divisions of Genesis, a couple of things, and we simply as we go through, see that it is not merely, as some folks see it, a book that gives us beautiful stories, you know, that we take from time to time and uh, teach from to simply say A or B or C. It is much more than a book relating stories to us or a book of history that tells us uh, some things that happened in the life of the Jewish people or some things that gives us a background to creation and just outlines stories. No, it is so much more than that. And uh, one of the things that we said in our earlier lessons is that the book of Genesis right there in the beginning. We said it means beginning, it means origin. It tells us the beginning of all things, the beginning of uh, the human race, the beginning of family life, the beginning of nations, the beginning of everything that we know. It all had its origins there in the book of Genesis. And so it's a book worth taking the time out to study, to appreciate, and to build upon. Now, one of the key things that we said at the very outset is that the book of Genesis, right there in the beginning, it literally shows us the plan of redemption. Clearly, we are seeing by just going through the book of Genesis, brothers and sisters, that the fall did not take God by surprise. It did not take God off guard. He was well aware. And from the very beginning, he started and he made plans. And listen to how God manifests his glory and his power. He, from the very beginning, started to show forth types of what would have been required in redemption so that what we have now come to accept, what we have now come to appreciate as salvation that covers the New Testament church, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, the shedding of his blood, and everything associated with redemption, we saw figures, types of it, as early as the book of Genesis itself, signaling that Almighty God knew what had happened, knew what was coming, knew that it was going to happen. And from even before the foundation of the earth, in his logos, in his mind, he made preparations for it. So that by the time the Genesis record was established, in the book itself, is the salvation, is the redemption story. And we see it and we will continue to see it as we survey the book, which we have been doing. And so it speaks about the sovereignty and the might and the power of God. And we see it in those simple ways manifesting itself in the book of Genesis. One of the things we had looked at, and we are not going to review because we have missed a couple of Wednesdays, we're not going to review a whole lot today. 
but certainly I would like for us to just appreciate the divisions of the book of Genesis. I, we did say, and we'll bring it up for us if we could just slide to the screen that shows us the divisions, we did indicate to us that the, the, the contents of Genesis can be divided into some divisions and we had broken down about nine major divisions. Of course, this breakdown is so that we can more easier study the book and we can see a particular flow that, so that we can appreciate what was done and how it was done in a kind of sequential way. And so we had nine divisions and it might be interesting for us to appreciate that it is not necessarily everyone looking into the book of Genesis will break it down in this way. Folks might have different measures, different means by which they break it down and divide it so that we appreciate it. But for this study, we have looked at uh, a nine division breakdown of the book and this so that we can see a flow and we can more easily go through the study and appreciate the survey of the book. The first division, we see the whole creation story being outlined. Then by the second division, we see the fall of man. Then the third division, we are seeing the first civilization, you know, how it came about and everything that had to do with the first civilization. And of course, we did say that things got so bad in that first period that after a while, every imagination of the heart of men was just evil continually. And to that extent, God decided that he was going to judge Amen. Pronounced judgment on the earth. And true to his word, he did just that. And having done that, we see the flood. Amen. Um, impacting this earth. The Bible said the windows of heaven, heaven was open and the fountains or the floodgates of the deep was loosed. And there was a massive flood that covered the entire earth earth. Amen. And then we look at the next division, which would have been about the fifth division. Uh, we see the dispersion of nations. And that was something that the Bible was clear on. Lots of questions are asked from time to time. How is it that folks are spread across the earth and we have the Chinese in their little territory. We have the Arabs in their little territory. We have the Caucasians in their little territory. We have the, the Africans in their little territory. And the Bible did give us a kind of breakdown as to how groups, different groups, dispersed and went into the different areas. And of course, these different areas have different conditions. Some of these areas are extremely hot. Others of this, these areas are extremely cold. Some are in between. And depending on where these different uh, tribes and groups went and lodged, some in the Caucasus Mountains, some in the African, some in the Sub-Saharan areas, the, the different conditions that were there somehow interacted with their system and you find that there are some with different uh, physical tendencies and appearances and we didn't go into it in details but it is one of the things that I did indicate that we are going to drill back down into so that we can give an overview and drill a little bit into how the different nations had their origins and why is it that some have black skins and some have white skins and we, we had promised that we would have gone back and drilled down a little bit so that we could appreciate that. We then move now to the, uh, to the sixth division and as we come into the sixth division down to the ninth, 
we find that all of these divisions speak to uh, the Jewish family, starting with Abraham, everything in Genesis from chapter 12 going onward had to do with the Jewish people. Everything before that was just the nations in general. Up to that time, there was no Jewish family, no Jewish nation, no Jewish father, so to speak. And starting with chapter 12 and the, the, the sixth division, the sixth division speak to us about Abra Abraham and from there it move on to the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, which speaks to Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And it is interesting, brothers and sisters, to, to understand and to appreciate that every one of these individuals that represented the patriarchs, the, the Jewish fathers, every one of them, their lives had some specific things that showed uh, that redemption that was to come later on. And it is so important that we see these things and we extract. It is as we start to go through these things that we realize and we recognize more and more that the Bible had to be inspired. It had to be God-breathed simply because the, the, the stories all tie together. The principles are common and they, they, they show a common thread and they clearly represent a flow coming all the way down to New Testament times. We look in Genesis and we see as we will go through, um, and we went through the book, the, the sixth division and looked at the life of Abraham. And we will just revisit a few things before we go on to the seventh division. But just looking at the book, we realize that in one of the escapades of Abraham, he met upon a man called Melchizedek. Now you're talking about hundreds, thousands of years ago. And yet, the Apostle Paul, as he was doing his writings and he wrote to the Hebrews at one point, and not only the Apostle Paul, but the King David himself, we find him writing in the book of the Psalms. And they both spoke to this same man, Melchizedek, that Abraham met back there in the book of Genesis. So that there is a connection, brothers and sisters, with Genesis and the Psalms. A connection with Genesis and the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. So that Paul the apostle spoke about the same individual that David spoke about. These men were separated by hundreds of years and yet they all spoke to a common figure that was mentioned in the book of Genesis. As we know, Genesis was written um, by Moses. Uh, the Psalm, particularly Psalm 110 verse 4 that speaks to Melchizedek was written by David. And then we also know that the book of Hebrews, and it is accepted by most scholars, that it was written by the book, by the apostle Paul. So that different writers, separated by hundreds of years, all wrote about the same thing and give a common description. It tells us that the book is inspired and that the, the story that it presents is not a make-believe Alice in Wonderland type of thing. But it is a common thread from Genesis all the way down through the Psalms, all the way going into the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, and it is consummated in the book of Revelation. One book, and the story flows from beginning to end. And so it is so very important that we understand and that we appreciate brothers and sisters that this thing is solid this thing is real this thing is true and so one of the things we can take away amen from a, a study of the book of genesis 
is simply that it confirms and reaffirms the validity of the book called the Bible. Because no matter how much years are in between things happening, they all seem to tie up, they all seem to come into alignment as we go further and further away from the book. And so it doesn't matter how far Genesis is from Revelation. It doesn't matter how far the Psalms are from the book of Genesis. The story is one seamless tapestry going down the annals of time and they align themselves and they come together and they present one complete comprehensive picture and it is the picture that God wants us to have of his redemptive plan and his grace and his desire to bring back man into alignment with what he had in store for them from the very beginning. He established the Garden of Eden and we said it before and because of sin we were cast out of the garden and a flaming sword was placed around to protect it from men coming back into that place until a certain time. So Genesis actually showed us the garden in its early stage before sin came and we saw that it was a most beautiful place. It was so beautiful not only in its physical attractiveness but in its spiritual significance because it was in that garden that God Almighty came down and commune with man in the cool of the day. So it was a, a place where it was cool, it was tranquil, it was peaceful, it was beautiful. It was just everything that a human being could ever imagine when it comes to peace and tranquility and beauty. And then that was crowned with the presence of Almighty God. It could not get any better. And then sin came and turned the entire thing upside down. And from that moment in the early parts of Genesis and things were turned around, this earth has never been the same again. We have seen snippets of beautiful gardens. We have seen snippets of people having great experiences with God. We ourselves have had great times in the presence of God, but it usually is transitory. We, we tend to ebb and flow and we're at a peak and then we come to a little trough sometimes and then we go back up. And so nothing was quite like it was in the early parts of the book of Genesis when we were in the garden. However, throughout the Bible, Genesis, Revelation, everything that happened in between was gearing in one direction, brothers and sisters, and it was in the direction of God's redemptive plan. Everything that happened prefigured and showed us that a time was coming when we would have been redeemed and having been re redeemed, we would have continued to live, live on this earth for a time until a certain period which Revelation speaks to when he would make all things new and he would move to restore what had been lost in Genesis, in the garden, so that we see in Genesis man being cast out of the garden. But then Revelation tells us what is going to be hereafter and we see man being restored to a place of bliss and peace and joy and happiness. We see, for instance, in the millennial period where Jesus Christ is going to reestablish things as it was in the very beginning. And we see where, oh, as, as men and animals, we see a coming together, amen, of humankind with the animal kingdom. And we will then appreciate that the lion and the lamb will be together. The, the lion will no more 
tear flesh and devour and destroy in all of Zion. Oh, but they will be calm and they will be peaceful and they will for their sustenance have straw and not have to kill a lamb and to kill another animal for their livelihood. And so things will be transformed and there will be peace. There will be restoration. Uh, people will live to be practically a thousand years of age. And I'm not talking about in the, the final things. I'm talking about in the millennial period. So there is going to be a restoration. And this could have only happened because of the fact that God initiated redemption from the very book of Genesis. So as we continue our survey, we will see where, you know, as we look through the life of Abraham, we see some of the things that happen. We see some of the ups and some of the downs. And as we survey you know, and look at the book and see the life of Abraham, we see that he had his great moments, he had his low moments. He had his ups, he had his downs. Even from Genesis, it is indicating to us that in our walk with God, in our walk as people of God, circumstances are often going to be going contrary to our heart, which is somehow moving in a direction of God moving towards serving God to the best that we know how. And we would probably imagine that God will ensure that our circumstances and our situations are such that we are always uplifted and we are always flying high and we are always, you know, accomplishing great things and things would be good for us as we serve the living God. But we see even in the book of Genesis, with Abraham, a man that was called the friend of God, a man that was the father of the faithful, even in his walk, circumstances were there. He had to separate from his family a lot. He had to go fight and get engaged in war to deliver a lot. He had, he had to separate from his son Ishmael that he loved so much. That must have been hard breaking it must have been a terrible feeling it must have had its emotional impact on the man but such is life and as we pursue God and as we walk in the way that he has made for us understand like Abraham did that there were going to be times when we are removed from things that we love from people that we love circumstances will cause all kind of things to happen circumstances does not dictate that you are not walking by faith and so no matter what happened we have to maintain our walk we have to be faithful to God just like Abraham and his life is a model for all of us amen to to benefit from and so we thank God for what we are picking up as we continue our survey of the book of Genesis so let me invite us to look at the screen again as we just quickly pick out one or two things from the, the, vision, the vision of uh, the book here. So we are in the sixth division and we are, we are seeing where, as we just mentioned, God asks Abraham to leave his country. Yes, and to leave his kindred and to leave his father's house and to go to a, a, a land, a place that God would show him. The, the fact is, Abraham didn't even know where he was going. And this is how we easily see the, that this was a man of great faith. Amen. No doubt, you know. Remember now, it's not like Abraham did not have any idea of who God was. We need to understand we need to be clear in our minds who Abraham's father was or who Abraham's grandfather was. Some of us forget that the antecedents, those that were above Abraham in terms of his daddy and his granddaddy and his great-granddaddy, he's coming down from a lineage uh, that Seth was in charge of and that was the line that called again upon the name of the Lord. So as we come down, we would have seen some great names 
uh, men in the Bible that was the, in the genealogy of Abraham. And remember now, some of these men lived for hundreds of years. So Abraham's daddy, Abraham's grandfather was coming from hundreds of years before that, his great granddad, hundreds of years before that, and they would have heard from their four parents who going back up all the way almost to Adam. Remember, Adam lived to about 900 and at, by the time that Adam passed, you know, Adam's, Adam's grandchildren would have been around, no doubt, when Abraham was there. We, I, so one of the things I'm going to do very shortly is put a chart to illustrate to us so that we can see some of the overlaps because we tend to feel that Abraham was far away, very, very far away from Seth, but he was not. Between Methuselah alone lived for almost 1,000 years. He lived through half of the period that the book of Genesis comprised. And folks are probably unaware of that because we are not able to conceive and to put the thing together. So I'm going to show us a chart. But I just want us to get through the, the survey of the book so that we can then drill into other things so that we then get a deeper appreciation for the book of Genesis. So Abraham, it's not like he had absolutely no idea of who the God of heaven was. No doubt his grandfather, his great-grandfather, because even at that time, men had still started to drift away from God again. One of the things that we said is that, one of the things that we said is that after Cain had killed his brother Abel, right? Cain was there, he was a, a murderer, and his offspring came and would have been born into that kind of situation. But the Bible said that Adam and Eve had another son at that time. And he, Seth, when he came and his offspring came, the Bible said, then men began to call again on the name of the Lord. But it was only a matter of time that the offspring of Seth and the offspring of Cain, Seth was the godly uh, lineage and Cain was the ungodly one. And it was just a matter of time as the offspring from both lines came. They were cousins. And so they, without doubt, started to meet up with each other. And we know exactly what happened. We spoke about it even recently in church. Because of what has been injected in this flesh, because of what sin has done to this body, there is no good thing that lies in this flesh. It has a tendency to gravitate to the things that are decaying, the things that are depraved, the things that are ungodly. It is the nature of flesh. So we that are moving and trying and, and doing everything we can to live for God, we have got to be vigilant at all times. We have got to be on top of things. We have got to be constantly prayed up. We have got to be constantly fasted up. We have just got to be in the word. If we are, if we reach the point, I should say, when we ease up on some of the things that we ought to be on to maintain our walk and our integrity with God, mark my word, we are going to, before we know it, our walk as godly people is going to gravitate over and we are going to tend to want to join those along the ungodly lane. Why? Because we have made way. We have opened a door for the base part of our being, which is our flesh. And it will always tend to gravitate to what is ungodly, what is of worldly pleasure. It always tends to do that. Never forget that. If we leave ourselves careless, it is natural that we are going to gravitate to that which is ungodly. And that is exactly what happened with the lineage of Seth and the lineage of Cain. They eventually came together. Because by the time we reached down to Noah's period, the Bible said 
men everywhere, every imagination of their heart was just evil continually. We tend to be depraved if we are careless and leave ourselves open and therefore we are not praying as we should and seeking the face of God as we should and living as we should, we will gravitate to ungodliness. Make nobody fool you. So when you have a brethren, when you have a brother, when you have a sister, someone whose encouragement to us all the time is, man, keep on praying. Man, keep on serving the Lord. When their encouragement to us is always uplifting and to, to seek the Lord continually, treasure that brother, treasure that sister, treasure that person because it, they are helping to keep us in check. Whenever there are those that will tell you, look, man, you're too much into church. Give yourself a break, man. Free up yourself and go enjoy life. There is no enjoyment in life that can be so good to the extent that you must enjoy it by marginalizing your walk with God. Any advice to marginalize your walk with God so that you can enjoy yourself otherwise is bad advice. A good advice is always to draw closer to Him, to seek to walk holy because holiness pleases God. Anybody tell you that you go to church too much and giving you advice that you must ease off, not good advice. Yes, we must balance our time and nothing is wrong with that. And I encourage that and we teach that. But as often as we get the chance to pray, to be in the house of the Lord, to fellowship with our brethren, nobody but nobody have the right to tell you to cut down on all of these things and give more space to your secular pursuit. We need to be balanced and we need to give to Caesar that which is due to Caesar, but we must give to God that which is due to God and let no one interfere with that. And so that is exactly what had happened even in Abraham's time. A lot of those around him were idol worshippers. A lot of those around him were no pagans. And remember, these were family members. Yes, because it was the lineage at the time of uh, Seth and the lineage of Cain. And they were brethren. But over time, the bad influence overpowered the good influence. And it is like that. And will be like that every time unless we make sure that we maintain our walk and our integrity with God. So Abraham had a, no doubt a background and an understanding of who Almighty God was. And I do believe that he knew the voice of God so that when God told him that I want you to leave. He knew that God was talking to him. It is not a case where he got up and his mind told him to just leave because he's tired of what was happening here and him just want to leave him family and him, him just want a new beginning, a fresh start and see new faces and him just go and leave and trust God to lead him. No, 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 no. He did not get up of his own volition and left and was then looking for a new environment to start a fresh and no, God told him to get up and to leave your kindred, to leave your country, and to leave your father's house. And these were tightly knit family units. So to just get up and walk, you had to know that God was speaking to you. And I do believe that Abraham knew the voice of God. So how did the faith come in? The faith come in in that when God said, get up and leave, the man knew all that he had because at that time, Abraham was a wealthy man. He was wealthy, the Bible said, in his flocks. He was wealthy, the Bible said, in silver and in gold. He was wealthy. He had his family. He had his ties. He had his connections there. But God spoke into his spirit. God spoke to him 
and he knew that he was, it was God because he knew who God was and he had experienced God. So it wasn't any, I wonder if I am doing the right thing. He knew, but his faith was such that if God said, based on what I have learned about God and based on who I now know him to be, I will move at his every word. And this we must understand as we survey in the, the, the sixth division and look at Abraham. He only wanted to know that this was God speaking. This was the word of God. And he would move. And he would move with alacrity. And this is how he became known as a man of faith and the father of the faithful. He believed God's word. Remember when he had to take his son and offer his one son. After he could not have children, himself and Sarah, she was barren. They couldn't have children. And at 80 years of age, he was still without a child and wondered if a child would ever come because his wife was barren. We eventually know that his child, the promised child came, which was Isaac. And yet God now spoke to him. It was like him dreaming and wonder what was happening. He knew God. He had experienced the Lord. He knew the voice of the Lord. And this is showing the faithfulness of the man, a man of faith and, and, and obedience. Because you will never exercise faith outside of obedience. Any man who is not obedient to the word of God, any saint who is not obedient to the word of God, cannot prove themselves later on to be men and women of faith. The two things that characterized Abraham, and they go hand in hand, he was obedient to the voice of the Lord, yes, obedient to the word of the Lord, and then he moved faithfully. God said it, I am going to do it, whatever the consequence. And so God said, look, I want you to offer up your son, your only son, Isaac. And of course, he did that to prove, to try, to test the heart of his servant Abraham. And as we survey, we are learning things from this. And Abraham, being obedient, obeyed and moved and got himself a dagger and would have sacrificed the man. I mean, it's hard to believe. But it was God and he knew the voice of the Lord. And nothing would stop this man from being obedient to the voice of Almighty God. And he moved to carry out the instructions of God in total obedience. Many of us would draw back and say, boy, God, I hear you, but this don't make sense. Boy, God, I hear you, but I can't do it. Not Abraham. Let's learn from him. He didn't even know that God was just taking him through a, a process, a testing process. But he moved with fear and obedience to carry out the request of God in a total obedience. And having done that, you know, we know the, the story. God stopped him and said, look, man, now I know. And this is the lesson for us as we do the survey and we look at the life of these pig tracks. Let us look for the little things that they did that in which God was well pleased. It was his obedience and it was his faith. He became the father of the faithful. Yes? And he was so known. And so I want us to understand he was asked to leave his country. He was asked to leave his kindred, leave his father's house, go to a place where God was going to show him. We know where he was going. And this is where the faith comes in. Walking by faith. He did not even know where he was going. He was just going according to the dictates of Almighty God. It is a lesson for us today, thousands of years later, 
a lesson for us. Even sometimes we, we know that we are walking with the Lord. We know our hands are wrapped up in his hands. But he's taking us to a place that we don't even understand what is happening. And we don't even understand what is happening in our lives. We don't understand why this is happening. We don't understand how we never get through with this. Hello, this is our going through our segment of circumstances. Which is exactly what Abraham in his time went through. Even though he was a man that was obedient and faithful, he had his situations. So will we. Let us look back at the chart as we, we, we quickly run through. And I will then uh, make one little injection before we go over to the to the seventh division, which would be looking at Isaac. Now, God had promised to make Abraham a great nation. He was going to bless him. He was going to make his name great. And I can tell you, God was faithful to his word. And even his faithfulness is not even yet complete. Because at item number four, which is a messianic promise, he said that the Lord was going to bless all the families of the earth through him. And it is, of course, we recognize that it is through his offspring and the Jewish race that Messiah the Prince actually came. And he will, in his time, and it is a time that is to come, everyone on earth is going to be blessed when he sits on his throne right here on planet earth in year in some time in the future and we are going to see at that time that item four is going to be fulfilled literally and that is something to come so god made his promise and this is a scripture that speaks with genesis 12 1 to 3 right so it is important that we know those things we saw where some highlights in Abraham's life where God called him to go to Canaan and then he had to go down into Egypt later on. Then we see where he had his own experience because himself and Lot, they were, of course, you know, he was Lot's uncle and they lived together because Lot's daddy, which was Abraham's brother, died years some time before and Abraham, Uncle Abraham, actually was the, the de facto father of Lot. And yet, there came a time when, they, because their families were growing, their livestock were growing, uh, it was just too much, and they were both wealthy people. So there was a separation, and Lot went his way, Abraham went his way. And so I mentioned it earlier, sometimes in life we have to separate. There comes a time when, and when I say separate, you know I mean, we go different ways, we take different avenues, uh, we do different things, we have different objectives, and we pursue what it is that, and where it is that we feel God is leading us. And so that happens. Sometimes there is hurt when we have that kind of movement, you know, but it is just how life is. And of course, uh, other highlights in his life, we see where God established a covenant with Abraham, and it is through that covenant that the Jewish nation, amen, would have come about and would have been separate and would have been different. And God would deal with them in a specific way and in a different way. In, in looking at other areas in the life of Abraham, we see where circumcision was given to Abraham. This was where circumcision started and it was a sign of the covenant between God and the people that was to come which is the children of Israel the Jewish people so a lot of things a lot of things happened amen in in Abraham's life as we go go through we see where the annunciation of Isaac's birth chapter 17 and and 18 speaks to that remember now Abraham and Sarah could not have children and yet at some point the prophecy came and the word came that you are going to have a son <coughs> and they were 
you know, we see that coming around um, later on in Abraham's life. Then we see in chapter 18, as we go down, we see Abraham interceding for Sodom because God determined that he was going to destroy that wicked place. And we, we, we must understand that sometimes even in our walk, or there are places, that when places are just wicked, we, are, we know that we must stand aside. We know that we must not be involved in certainty. But never forget that the folks that reside in 21st century Sodom, they are still souls. So sometimes we are tempted, brothers and sisters, to wash our hands because of how wicked people are. But that was the situation in Genesis. There is nothing new under the sun. And here it was that uh, Sodom, with all of its wickedness, its, its, its idolatry, its, its sodomy in terms of homosexuality and lesbianism and all of the evil things that we can think about, it was very much there. And yet, Abraham was literally interceding that God, interceding that God would spear them and because his was a heart, no doubt, that appreciated souls. And we must learn from that. We see what is happening, the constant murders, the, 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 so much is happening in our little island home, Jamaica. But don't limit it to Jamaica. Look over what is happening in the States. Look across what is happening in Europe. With, just look across and so much dangerous things, so much wicked things. And sometimes we are tempted to say, God, get these murderers and just kill them. I don't care. And any lady that hosts them. Their girlfriends, God just killed the whole them lock, stock, and barrel, and it is it, it, it comes to the hearts of many for God to just wipe them out. But you know, we have to still remember, just like righteous Abraham, when we look at all that happened in Sodom, the man still turned around and interceded for Sodom. Brethren, we learn from Genesis as we do the survey that we need to see things as they are, as wicked as it is. Have a heart that understands that these are people that need God. And our intercession and our constant praying, we will never know what comes out of it. Of course, we expect measures to be taken and the, the, the feet to be placed on the ground to curtail what is happening. But in all that we are doing, let us remember that we need to be praying and we need to be interceding on behalf of the unsaved. They are souls and they need God. And we can present a God of mercy and his redemption plan to them. As we go further in highlights in the life of Abraham, we see again another tragedy in the life of Abraham. But now he has to push out Hagar. That is the mother of his child. He had to push out Agar. He was instructed. Sarah told him she's not going to stay here. The, the bond woman and her child not going to be here with her son. And she was down on Abraham to get rid of her. Remember now, you know, is this same Sarah caused the problem in the first place that pushed Abraham to go and be with her. Now when she have her own and she said that there was rivalry between the two boys. She decided that, look here, him can't stay here. He will not have any inheritance with my son. And guess what? God spoke to Abraham and told him, boy, Sarah is right. And just imagine how heart-wrenching this is that Abraham will now have to put out Hagar, the mother of his son. And not only just to send out Agar, but his own son, his firstborn, Ishmael. That must have been heartrending. That must have been emotionally disturbing to the man. Because remember, even though he was a friend of God, even though he was the father of faithful, he was a man. And he must have had his situations. Then, of course, as we go over a little bit further down, we see him offering up Isaac and exactly what we spoke about a while ago. Then we see him in verse 24 uh, arranging 
for a bride for Isaac. And then later on, he was married again and he had more children. And by we reach down to verse 25, the grand finale, and then the great patriarch, Abraham, actually died. And so we, we need to understand that as children of God today, walking with God, pursuing righteousness, we are no different. There is so much that we have learned as we go through the divisions. And in this sixth division of the book of Genesis, we can learn that as Abraham obeyed God and stepped out in faith, brothers and sisters, we are to obey God because Paul said it to the, the Hebrew believers, his obedience and faith in God, that's Abraham's, is obedient by hearing the voice of God and doing what God said to do, whatever the cost, even if it cost him the life of Isaac, his son, the hearer, by faith, even if it cost that boy's life, Abraham was willing to be obedient to God at all costs. And in Hebrews chapter 11, just read down through, 18 to 19, through 8 to 19, and you will see where Paul is saying that Abraham's obedience and faith in God literally stands out as a memorial to all generations, brothers and sisters, that literally include us. Make no mistake about it. So we are called upon, we are called upon to learn from Abraham and to practice, to practice obedience and faith. We would have learned this from Daddy Abraham. And this we are, we are seeing and appreciating as we survey the book of Genesis. So now we are on to the seventh division. And we are seeing Isaac. And Isaac is here um, coming on the scene. We know that prior to Isaac being here, uh, Ishmael was born. But he was born through his mother and he came through his mother Agar. But they were not the promise. Ishmael was not the promise, and the promise was not supposed to have come through Agar. The promised son was Isaac, and he was supposed to have come through Sarah or Sarah. And so we see as we look at the seventh division, the emergence, the birth of the son of promise, and that was Isaac. Isaac noticed some things about Isaac. Isaac was the one that was chosen by God to carry on the plan of redemption. Yes? And I want us to notice, brothers and sisters, some points here as we go down. Don't be lost now, but I want us to take the time out and look, appreciate some points that we are making here now. Because we are going to do a comparison. I told us earlier on in the study, and I made mention of it, uh, since we started this evening, that in Genesis, it speaks on numerous occasions to redemption. From as early as Genesis chapter 3, uh, immediately after the fall, the Bible gave us the promise that there was going to be a Messiah, a Redeemer, and he was going to turn things around and bring back things to what God wanted it to be in the first instance, right? The Bible tells us, in, and the promise was made in Genesis chapter 3 and about verse 15, and we need to know that from as early as there, Genesis 3 verse 15, as early as from there, God was giving his hints and making his word known that a Messiah, a Redeemer was going to come. And God does his thing in a way. He somehow didn't just come out straight. I, whatever his reasons for veiling his promises, although he makes it plain and we pick it up, 
but it comes out in a veiled way. So in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, that I, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was a clear warning to Satan. And a clear word of prophecy, messianic prophecy, that someone was coming who was going to hit you out. Now Satan hearing this, and hearing this coming from God, he knew that something was coming. He knew that something was going to happen. He knew that something was coming to knock him out cold, technical knockout. But he didn't know when, he didn't know who, he didn't know where. And this is how God works. It is not only with us as people. That he gives a word but doesn't tell us the how and the where and the when and the why. Even has, you see, God is sovereign and he knows every nitty gritty detail. But it is a thing and a way that God works. And even as he works with the adversary, he could say, look here, I am going to put, make you and the woman the enemies. I am going to cause thy seed and her seed to be at odds. And know this. Satan, it shall bruise thy head, even though you are going to bruise his heel. What does that mean? Satan don't even know, but he know that something was coming, and I want us to understand that. So God is like that. So here are some important points in Isaac's life, and they all speak to something that was going to come to someone, what was going to come to an event that was going to happen, but God veiled it. But yet pointed it out, brothers and sisters, right here, here in the book of Genesis. Genesis speaks in certain eras, for example, in this seventh division, and showed Isaac to be none other than a type of Christ. He shows Isaac's life story to be none other than a type of the redemptive story that was supposed to come and manifest itself in Jesus Christ himself. So here we see his birth was promised. And we are going to do a, a brief comparison in, in a very short while. Then we see he was bound upon an altar of sacrifice. And all of this, you know, you're talking about his birth being promised. Genesis 15 verse 4. Genesis 17 verse 19. Birth was promised. Then look, he was bound on an altar of sacrifice. Genesis 22 and verse 9. Then, bride was chosen by Abraham for him. Genesis 24, 1 to 67. Read the entire st story. Then, we see God renewed the covenant made to Abraham. And he renewed that covenant with Isaac. New covenant. Genesis 26, verses 2 to 5. Then we see that he was deceived by Jacob. Genesis 27, verse 18. Then we come to the death of Isaac. Genesis 35, 28 and 29. These are all, brothers and sisters, important points in the life of Isaac. But as we review these highlights, it is easy for us, brother and sister, Sisters, to pick out some things that makes it abundantly clear that it typifies the life of Jesus Christ. Let us consider some of the things that we just said. We just said his birth was promised. And we, we, we further want to make a little comparison. Look at what is happening now. The, his miracle birth. Genesis 18, 9 to 18. You can, we can't read them now. Look at it. Make notes of what scriptures are here. I want us to read them, brothers and sisters. And then compare that to St. Matthew 1, 18 to 21. Make the comparisons. Very important. We are seeing that everything in the life of Isaac somehow typifies the life of Jesus Christ. His life was a type and of what was going to happen in the life of Jesus. 
as Jesus moved to bring redemption on this land. And brothers and sisters, it is spoken of right here in the book of Genesis. As we survey, we see these things jumping at us and therefore we are saying it is important to recognize this and to see how great and powerful a God we serve. He knows the end from the beginning and he sets things up in Genesis simply because he knows what is going to happen down the line and he can easily prefigure and make types of these things because he is God. Now, look at the second thing, sacrifice. Genesis 22, 1 to 14, speaks about what Abraham was going to do. He took his only son, Isaac, and carried him to sacrifice him on an altar. And when we compare that to St. Matthew chapter 27, and we go down, we see where Jesus was the sacrifice that was going to be offered on an altar, the altar of the cross. Remember now, when a sacrifice is made, you know, and you're on the altar, the blood had to flow. What God did, he took back Isaac up. He didn't go through with it because he saw what was in Abraham's heart. But he was just showing, making a typology of what was to come and the real sacrifice. Because in the story of Genesis, when God took, allowed Abraham to take up back Isaac, he made provision. And a ram was in the ticket that ultimately was sacrificed. So blood was still shed. A sacrifice was still made on an altar right there. And later on, it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ himself. And so St. Matthew 27, verses 22 and 23, compares with Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14. A very important point. So we see that happening in respect of his miraculous birth. We see the same thing happening in respect to the sacrifice that was, was made. So, and that is absolutely, absolutely awesome. Then we see, thirdly, their deliverance from death. You realize that when Isaac was offered up on that sacrifice, God stepped in and said, look, stop. And Isaac got up and was taken off the altar. Go right over into St. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 6. And we see that after Jesus was sacrificed, after his death on the cross, Matthew 28, up from the grave he arose. He was delivered from death and he is to die no more. So that everything that we are seeing so far in the life of Isaac is birth, which was miraculous. The fact that he was to be sacrificed by his father and notice that he was the only son according to promise that Abraham had. So the, the scripture even say your, your only son. Remember now, you know, he already had, and this is Abraham, he already had a son, and yet, which was Ishmael, and yet when he was going up to offer up his son Isaac, he said, boy, God tell him to offer up your only son and so yes he had a son already but only son really means because he was a son according to promise and he was the only one that could fit that bill which was Isaac so we see the miraculous birth it compares to Jesus the sacrifice he compares to Jesus the deliverance from death compares to Jesus and now servant seeking a bride. I want us to recognize that Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for Isaac. Isaac needing a bride. Remember, no, you know, so far we are showing Isaac being a type of Christ. And if Isaac being a type of Christ is now finding a bride, it means that Christ, when he comes, will have to also have a bride associated with him. But we are seeing that indeed Jesus Christ has a bride 
and that bride is none other than the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. And it is spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. It is spoken about in Ephesians chapter number 5, 25, 26, and 32. It is spoken about in Acts chapter 15 uh, and verse 14. Brethren, beloved, I want us to understand that what we are seeing here in the seventh division, what we are seeing here in the book of Genesis, as we survey the book, we are seeing messianic promises. Earlier we made mention of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. We are seeing messianic promises. We are seeing types of Christ showing up in the lives of some of these patriarchs. And it is simply saying to us that things are not by chance, but they are organized, they are well planned out, amen? And we need to see these things so that we can appreciate that this book is real. I made mention of Genesis 3 and verse 15 speaking about a Messiah that was to come, you know, a messianic prophet. Then there is Genesis 12, 1 to 3. We made mention of it earlier. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse at thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That, that was another messianic promise indicating that through his lineage, through him, one will come that will cause blessings to come upon the entire earth. And we know that to be none other than Mess Messiah the Prince, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we are seeing in the seventh division that Isaac was a type of Christ. And the things that Jesus Christ accomplished when he came to earth to bring about our salvation, these things manifested themselves thousands of years before in the life of Isaac. And we are seeing these things jumping at us, jumping right into our present day reality. And we can therefore easily see that this book of beginnings is not something that came up out of the imagination of a man. It's not a man writing what he think might have happened. And even though the author was not there, when we now start to look closely and see the interconnection with things that were to come, fitting the bill perfectly, it did not matter that Moses was not there when in the beginning took place and the words were uttered by the voice of God and things came together, it did not matter that Moses was not there. The one who was there, who is God Almighty, inspired the mind and the heart of Moses and instruct him what he ought to write and how he ought to write. And he did that and putting everything else that was at his disposal together, he came up with this book. And the book of Genesis is a true report, a true reflection, a, an indication, and a reality of what happened in Genesis 1 and what continued to happen throughout the entire book of Genesis. Brothers and sisters, we can rest assured that this book is authentic, this book is inspired, the contents are real, the stories have things attached to them that are types, of the real thing that was to come. And when we start to look at the New Testament scriptures associated with these scriptures in Genesis, we see that there had to be a real powerful intervention by an unseen hand. And that is none other than 
Almighty God. And I want us to accept that. We now jump over to another division, the eighth division. And this speak to the patriarch, Jacob. And so we are taking some time and we are looking at the life of Jacob. And we are going to look at some outstanding events, important events that actually took place in his life. And even there, we will see how easily, amen, some of the things there have uh, connections with things that were to come later on in the future. Now, Jacob was one of Isaac's two sons. Esau was the elder of the twin brothers. And so, although Jacob was the younger, mark you, they were twins, but even with twins, one is older. Whoever came out first, he might be older by a few hours. Doesn't matter, he's older. So, Jacob was the younger. Yet, he was chosen as a channel of blessing over Esau, who was the elder. And according to Jewish custom, the elder was supposed to be the one through whom the blessing comes. He was supposed to be the one that become the priest of the house. He was the one that was supposed to be the bearer, the channel of the blessing that was passed from father, amen, to the next generation. And it always, always flowed through the firstborn. And if the firstborn was a female, then it will flow through the firstborn male whenever that male came and such should have been the case but the order seemed to have been reversed and remember God is sovereign and God alone does things according to his own will he chose to pass it on through a different channel and this case, in this case the channel of the younger and I guess as we go on further we will see why but let us take a look brothers and sisters at a few outstanding events in the life of this man, patriarch Jacob. Yes, his purchase of his brother's birthright. And remember, the birthright is very significant. It establishes you as the firstborn, and therefore everything that daddy has that was to be passed down, that would place him in a position of authority, that will place him in a position of power within the ranks of the family that was bestowed, up, bestowed upon the firstborn. And he had that right. And under no circumstance should he give that up. That was his scepter of leadership over the family. But at a time when Esau was down, on his face, hungry. Jacob seemingly was very witty and he presented the situation in a way to the extent that he bought his brother's birthright. So remember now, he did not steal it. He bought it. And there was an exchange. And so chapter 25 goes into this Event. And this was a very significant event in the life of Jacob because at this point, he now has taken upon himself a position of authority and leadership, a priestly position, even though his mannerism and his lifestyle was still one that was one characterized by deception and deceit. And, and, and all that kind of things coming and so forth. Mark you, even though he bought it, it was through a kind of trickery. Not, nevertheless, he bought it. He somehow seemed to have seen and appreciate the value of spiritual things. And as we go through his life, we are going to recognize and that he does. And we are going to recognize that it is something that God saw and something for which he loved Esau, uh, Jacob, sorry, and despised Esau. For a man to give up his spiritual authority for money or for natural things 
you can see why he would be despised. But for somebody to use even trickery to get and to acquire and to seek to achieve spiritual heights, spiritual things, it is something that although the means is wrong, but when you look at what the man was trying to achieve and accomplish, you can understand why God might later on at some point have said, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I hated. The man just aspire, even in a state of being deceptive and being a trickster. The man aspired for spiritual things. I mean, the man was a deceiver to the extent that him deceived even his own daddy. Genesis 27 gives us that outline and we're just looking through the, the life of Jacob. And as a result of this, he had to run away from home. And he ran and he went to Padanaram and there he met upon Laban. On his way, he had a vision and he vowed a vow and he started a, a trek to establish himself as a son of God. He became repentant and he started to seek after God and etc. etc. Started to build himself, started to climb, so to speak. And um, it reached the point where he had a very personal experience with God. I mean, I jumped over the part where he met up with Laban and he had his dealings with, with Laban. And, and I must tell us, we need to understand something very important. Even with his vision and his vow in chapter 28 to start walking with God and he started a new chapter in his life and he was really pushing and doing his best to reconstruct his life and to draw near to God and to live for God because he, has done so, he had done so much in the past that was wrong and he deceived his father, uh, he kind of conned his brother although he, he bought the birthright but it was through some con man art that he did it and then he deceived his dad and he was always doing that but there is something in life that we are learning right here as we go through the survey of the book of Genesis doesn't matter who we are, be sure that we understand the principle, brothers and sisters, that whatever a man sow, he will reap. And God literally allowed Jacob to, yes, he left his homeland because of what he did, and he ran away and he reached as far as the Padanaram, and he, along, along his journey, he had a vision of a ladder from heaven to earth and he recognized that God is in that place and he really reached out and he really surrendered to God and he built an altar which represents repentance and everything and he made his vow and he really was pursuing God. But once he reached over, according in chapter 31, once he reached to Laban, uh, lots of things started to happen in his life. Because he made plan now was to marry to his beautiful wife. I believe she was Rachel. And as he was there and he worked, planned to work for seven years, at the end of the seven year period, he was expecting the beauty, the one he loved, only to find that he was tricked and he was given Leah, the one that he did have no intention to marry to. And then he was asked, well, if you need to have her, you're going to have to work seven more years. And he did it. And then he got the, 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 the wife of his choice. But he started to get retribution. He started to get payback for the very things that he did. And this is happening to him even after he made his vows to God, even after he had his vision. We have to be very careful how we tread, brothers and sisters. And we have to understand that God is not asleep. And if you dare to deal treacherously with your brothers and your sisters, don't think that it is going to go unseen and unchecked by Almighty God. We are learning this 
even as we go through and have a panoramic overview of the book of Genesis, whatever you sow, you are going to reap and he met upon his match. God used Laban, Laban to execute payback on Jacob for what he did in the past. Now, I might just add, for us, when we are out in the world, we are going to do the things that do, is expected of people in the world. And that's fine. When we come to the Lord and we place that on the altar that now goes behind us, the account for that is totally wiped clean. So none of those things will come back to us. What we must be very careful about, brothers and sisters, is when we now get saved and when we now acquire knowledge and when we now become mature and we understand what is required of us and when the word is presented, brothers and sisters, we will have no excuse when the word is presented to us and we reject the word. We will have no excuse when the Bible tells us what is right, <coughs> sorry, and we reject the right, we will have no excuse when the word is present to, presented to us and we seek to tune it out because we don't want to hear it. Because why? That very word that you might be hearing will rise up to condemn you for certain actions that you plan to take. So you tune the word out. That will not tune out the retribution that is going to come. Because you are supposed to know that word at this stage in your Christian walk. So I might use the opportunity, brothers and sisters. I might use this teaching moment to let us understand. Mind as well, we open our hearts and our minds. Mind as well, we open up our systems to take in the word and to embrace it and to apply it. Because even if we tune it out, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. We should have known. And there is no excuse for not knowing. We go about and we still at this point in our Christianity, at this point in our walk with God, there are folks that still continue to tear down and to break down and to slaughter with their tongue, their brothers and their sisters. At this point in our walk, there are still those who can't even appreciate the, who we are as brothers and sisters. It cannot be right. Be sure. Certainly from what we are seeing in the survey of Genesis. Uh, yes, he met God with a vision and he vowed his vow and he established his altar. But Laban was there to execute God's payback for the things that he willfully did. To hurt his brother, to hurt his father, to hurt those that were around him. You mark my word. And so let us gear, let us use this and learn from these events in the life of Jacob in the eighth division that we are going through to adjust ourselves and make sure that we have things properly lined up. All right. We see where he wrestled with an angel in chapter 32. And this was the real turning point in the life of Jacob. And all of us will have a time when we go through some experiences that marks a major turning point in our life. And as a result of that, the man was in a frame of mind where he could move to reconcile with his brother. Yes, to reconcile with those that he had wronged. And we thank God that he was able to do that according to chapter 33. And of course, we see in chapter 46, 
where he had to leave where he was and he had to go down into Egypt. And in Egypt, he met again with Joseph who was taken away from him. And so we kind of have a, a, a full feel of what transpired in the life of this patriarch uh, David, uh, patriarch Jacob, I'm sorry. And so I just want to pull out quickly some simple lessons that we can add to what I already said earlier on. And I make the point, lesson number one, can we see the power of the grace of Almighty God? When we examine the life of Jacob, his conmanship, when we consider all that he did, his brother, his father, everything, we see easily that only the power of God's grace could have caused God to still walk with this man. He, God walked with Jacob for about, I think when we do the maths and we look at the amount of years, you're talking roughly 32 years. 32 years worth of upping and downing and tricks and scamming and, and, and sinfulness and wickedness and 32 years and God still found it inside of him, God, to meet with Jacob and wrestle, wrestle with him at the brook of Jabok and transform the man, not just his character, but the entire man, down to his name was changed from Z Jacob, which means supplanter, trickster. And he was transformed and his name changed to Israel, which means a prince with God. Mighty God. An overcomer with God and man. This is the grace of God. And although God meet out back to him, you know, retribution, it doesn't mean that because God allows some things to happen to you because of things that you had done before. It doesn't mean that because God do that, he's done with you. No. That was the just recompense because of things that you and I did. But the grace of God covers all of that. And he still holds on to us. And he still shows his great compassion to us. And ultimately will save us. So lesson number one, we are seeing the power of God's grace. Lesson number two, we are seeing how God esteems faith very highly. Right? We are seeing in lesson number two, God placed a high premium on faith. Jacob's scheme and everything to obtain his brother's birthright is inexcusable. Yet, we see where God declared that I love Jacob. You know why? Because of his earnest desire for and his appreciation of spiritual things. The man by faith him wanted the things that he knew matters most and that was spiritual things. And brothers and sisters, we all have our weaknesses. We all have our shortcomings. But I can tell you that man who deep down in his heart have a desire for God and the things of God, take it from me, that man is going to be seen in a different light. Is going to be seen in a way that you are going to recognize that God places a premium upon people that desires, that goes after, that wants at all costs spiritual things. Brethren, desire God. Brethren, love God. Brethren, want God. You're, and if you move by faith, in spite of your shortcomings, 
But if we move by faith to attain unto spiritual things, we are going to find that God move heaven and earth to accommodate us. No one would have thought they would have heard such a sentence. Jacob have I loved. Esau I hate. How could we expect such a statement? Particularly love to the one who was such a scammer. But he appreciated, he desired, and he wanted things that were spiritual. It means he desired, ultimately it means he desired God. Now as matter that he did the things that he shouldn't have done to attain it, God dealt with him for that. But he makes sure that he preserved him so that he could pour out upon him the bounties associated with a heart that loves God and loves the things things of God. We must learn this lesson. And finally, the third lesson, and we made mention of it, but let us look at it. Quickly push it up on the screen because I want us, we just made mention of it, but I'll push it up as lesson number three because it is important. I said it before, but I want us to see it again and add it so that we see three life lessons coming out of Jacob's life coming out of our overview of the book of Genesis. As I said before, lesson number one, the power of the grace of God. Lesson number two, God's high estimate of faith and also on the man that appreciates, yearns for, and pursue spiritual things. And then lesson number three, final lesson. And it is summed up in the scripture in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I did say it earlier on. Jacob's uncle Laban was used as an instrument of retribution for the disciplining of Jacob. Jacob had cheated others. He in turn was cheated by Laban. And that is very, very interesting. And at the same time, it sends across to us a sharp lesson. And it is important that we learn that lesson. And therefore, take seriously. Know that we are in the body. Know that we are walking. Know that we are serving God. Know that we are pursuing him. Be careful more than any, ever before, more than any other time. Be careful how we walk. Be careful how we treat our brothers and our sisters. Be care it was his brother and his father that he treated that way. With us, we are talking about anybody that we associate with. Our own family members outside of the church, our own family members inside of the church. Why? Because we are in the church now and we ought to know better. And for what we are supposed to know and therefore for what we are supposed to do when we turn our backs on that and then blatantly do things that the Bible tells us to stay away from and we tear down and we malign and we hurt and we squeeze and we pull down God's business. Be careful whatsoever a man soweth is the third lesson. That shall he also reap. And we need to be extremely careful. It takes me now to the final division. <coughs> I'm sorry. It takes me down now to the final division, which is division chapter 9, and we are looking at uh, Joseph. Amen. Because he is also mentioned in Genesis. And right between chapters 30 to 50, 
we see the life of Joseph being outlined. Joseph was Jacob's favorite of his 12 sons. And he was also favored, highly favored by the Lord. Because the Lord had actually given him some dreams and told him what was going to happen, what was going to happen in his life. And you know that he was going to achieve great things and his brothers will be subservient to him and a lot of things. That it, it reached the point where because of what God was doing in his life and the dreams that God was giving him and him understanding the dreams and relating it to his brothers, it somehow causes, caused them to be envious of him and ultimately they sold him into slavery. But you know, sometimes it doesn't matter and especially if you are innocent, even if you are wronged, but you are innocent, God defends you. And sometimes folks don't even know that many times when they do things against you and certain actions are taken, they don't even realize that it is in the will of God. So God used their, what was meant for evil and make good out of it. And we have to be very careful. So they sold him into Egypt because they were envious of him and how God was using and working with him and working through him. But God continued to be with Joseph and in Egypt, and that was very significant. After, you know, a lot of adversity, and we know what he went through in, throughout the years. He was locked up in prison. He was tempted um, by Potiphar's wife, and as a result of that, thrown into prison. And we know everything that happened to him. He was forgotten while he was in prison. And ultimately, it would appear that he was not going to come out too much. It would appear that way. He was there for a couple of years well. And when a man at that age, because he was a young man, from probably teens going up into 20s until he reached just about 30. So a lot of time was spent between being locked up um, from one place to the other. And it just seemed as if nothing would have happened that would have facilitated his release, but the Bible said God was with him, and that is what is most important. But just going through, we, we, without going into the story, we know that there was a famine over there in Canaan, and they had to come over into the land of Egypt to get grains. And incidentally, it was here at this time, under the circumstance that was there, that his brothers, when they came over and saw him and recognized that he was the one that was in charge of the food distribution, they bowed before him and instantly in a moment, what was given to Joseph in a dream, what God prophesied years before, it just came to pass right there and then. The brothers at this time didn't even know that this was what was happening. But I'm telling you, when God puts this thing together, amen, time and space does not stop, stop it. Nothing at all stops what God has put in place and has set in motion. Now, jo Joseph's experience was a part of the plan of redemption. Most folks, I want us to look again because we are showing us, we are literally showing us, amen, that God is in control. We are literally showing us that God knows what he's doing. We can see in the life of Joseph we can see in the experiences that he had that a part of the salvation plan, the redemption plan of God to redeem mankind manifested itself in his life. God literally permitted, it didn't happen by chance, brothers and sisters, this was planned, this was orchestrated and God used the occurrence and established by permitting it to happen, establish a sequence of things that would have shown that his very life and experience expressed God's plan of redemption. And so Joseph, follow me now, was sold 
into Egypt and to suffer. But all of that at an end and a time after the suffering would have come when the same Joseph would have been exalted. And that being the case, when he was exalted, he would then be in a position to bring his entire family into that land where they all could be nourished during the time of famine that was taking place everywhere else in the world. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we are seeing something emerging here already. And so it is important that we are seeing this coming, jumping at us, <coughs> sorry, so easily sold into Egypt and to suffer and then later on to be exalted and being in that exalted position, he brings his family over into that place where they were, he was so that they could be nourished and be protected and kept from the famine that was across the entire world, it sounds very familiar. And so I want us to bear that in mind. Then I want us to look at some main points here in the life of Joseph. One, he was loved by his father. He was envied by his brethren. He was sold to the Ishmaelites. Then he was favored by his master. He was tempted by his master's wife. He was imprisoned by Potiphar. And ultimately, he was exalted. So we're not looking at who did what. We're not looking at the fact that it was Pharaoh that exalted him. We're not looking at the fact that it was Potiphar that imprisoned him. We're not looking at the fact that it was the mass, um, Potiphar's wife that tempted him. No, we're not looking at the fact that it was the Ishmaelites to whom he was sold. No, what we're looking at is that he was loved, just as Jesus was. He was envied by his brethren, just like Jesus was. He was sold, just like Jesus was. He was favored, just like Jesus was favored by the Father. He was tempted. Just like Jesus was, except that Jesus, just like Joseph, did not sin. He was imprisoned, just like Jesus was. And he was ultimately exalted, just like Jesus was. But we're not finished. He was unrecognized by his brethren at their first meeting, just like Jesus was after the resurrection. They came and saw him and didn't even know that it was he. But brothers and sisters, I wonder if we see exactly what is happening. He was revealed to his brethren at the second meeting. He was reunited with his father later on. And then the story ends with the death of Joseph. Brothers and sisters, a whole lot is happening here. A whole lot of things we are seeing as we prepare to close uh, this last division and therefore close out on the, the survey of Genesis before we start to go into some specific lessons that we are going to look at in the book of Genesis. Brothers and sisters, these things are showing us that it is not coincidence. It is not just a book that was put together. The writings of Genesis was deliberate it shows us in the life of Jacob. It shows us in the life of Joseph. It shows us in the life of the Isaac. It shows us in the life of Abraham. Things that were going to be, become real in the dispensation that you and I are in today. When the real salvation come, when the real sacrifice was made. Everything else before was a type. Even the sacrifices that occurred during the tabernacle and the tent. They were all a shadow of what was to come. The reality 
was when Jesus died on the cross and shed his own blood. He, the altar was there, the sacrifice was there, who was Jesus, the blood was shed, which was his blood, the, 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 the high priest was there, who was Jesus himself, so that he was the, the high priest that offered up his life to God and he was the very God that received the offering. It was his blood that was shed. The cross that he died on was made from wood, from the trees that were around. And guess who spoke and trees came into existence? The same Jesus, the same God. So he was the creator of the tree that made the cross. So it was his altar, his cross. It was his blood. He was the sacrifice who was the lamb. He was the high priest that was offering the sacrifice. He was the God to whom the sacrifice was offered. He was everything. And so I hear the writer say, he is my everything. He is my all. How can it be that he is the God who received the sacrifice? He is the high priest who offered the sacrifice. He is the lamb who is the sacrifice. His is the blood that was shed that was the blood of the sacrifice. His was the cross because he made the tree from which the cross was erected. Everything belonged. He did it all for you and me. All oh, love of God, so full and free. All of this came together in the book of Genesis. The redemptive power and work of God was shown right in Genesis and it was presented before our very eyes. Brothers and sisters, as with his forefathers, Joseph's life typified the life of Jesus Christ. His father's love for him, compare Genesis 37 verse 3, and St. John chapter 5, verse 20. The hatred of his brethren. Compare Genesis 37 and Matthew 27, verse 1, verses 22 and 23. Do the comparisons, brothers and sisters. Look at his temptation. Genesis 39, verses 7 to 12, and Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. His patience in suffering. Look at Genesis 39, verses 20. Um, Genesis 41, verse 1, and also look at, compare to James chapter 5 and verse 11. My God, we jump over his promotion by Pharaoh. Look at what happened in Genesis 41, verses 39 to 44, and compare that to what happened in Mark 16 and verse 19. Brothers and sisters, I, w look, I want us to recognize, look at his marriage to a Gentile bride during his rejection by his brethren. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. In Genesis 41, verse 45, I want us to know that Joseph married not to anybody from in his own kind, from his own kind. He did not marry someone from his side, from his tribe, from within his grouping. No, he married inside of Egypt, I believe his bride was a daughter of one of the fearer, one of the, 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 the high profile leaders in Egypt, a Gentile bride he took. And guess what? Jesus, because he was rejected by his own, he turned to the Gentile and took out of them a bride. For his name, look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. The life of Joseph typifies the life of Christ every step of the way. His revelation of himself to his brethren the second time. Look at Genesis chapter 45 verses 1 to 3. And later on look at Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. When his Bible, according to Zechariah 12, he's going to stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And he's going to show himself to his brethren that I was indeed the very Christ, your Messiah that you rejected. And on that second occasion, when he's standing that day up on the Mount of Olives, they are going to recognize that indeed this was and is our Lord, Messiah, the Prince himself, the King of Kings, who is going to sit on the throne of his father, David. All of this, Brothers and sisters, 
came together in the life of Joseph. So, the book of Genesis closes with Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph, then bestowing his patriarchal blessing upon his own 12 sons, and with Jacob, Joseph, going the way of all men, dying and moving from the stage of time. Brothers and sisters, what we have done over the last couple of weeks was to survey the entire book of Genesis. We see the historical events. The world was formed. Hum humankind was made. We saw sin in the world. We saw the introduction of family time. We family life, we saw the introduction, amen, of the story of redemption or the plan of redemption. We saw the formation of nations. We saw the dispersion of nations. We saw God sending the flood, everything. We saw, we, we, have, we have done over these couple of weeks, we have had a panoramic view of the book of Genesis. A simple book, but a profound book. It gives us an introduction to the rest of the Bible. It gives us an introduction to the theme of the Bible, which is redemption, the plan of redemption. And we see what happened here, the fall, and then the plan for restoration and reconciliation. And it all transpired. It all happened over time through all the books going down until we reach in the book of the Gospels and we saw Jesus Christ coming and we saw the sacrifice that he made and after the sacrifice we saw the movements of the church from the book of Acts until this very day and we are living in the follow-up to Genesis and we are going to come now in a little while to the close of the event the rapture of the church the entering into the millennium and the restoration of the pre-sin period and we are going to have a grand time here on earth for a thousand years and thereafter final things will come and the book of Genesis has given us a clear concise picture of the development of things as we know it today and I invite us to take time and review these lessons it's very important so that as we go on, we will have a deep and profound appreciation of the things that are there. And so, when we get back together, God's willing, for the next Bible study, that's next week, we are going to drill down into some things. I want to take us to talk about Melchizedek. I want to take us to talk about how we have the nations scattered. Where did they come from? Where did the different uh, races originate? I want us to talk about some things that are there that have questions, uh, question signs around them as we continue to explore the book of Genesis and thereafter we see how we proceed. The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. We have come to the end of another Bible study. God's willing, next week we pick up and continue. Let us pray. Father, we come before your great and your awesome presence and we thank you for enabling us and allowing us this evening to go through uh, some more in the book of Genesis. Thank you, Lord, for where you have been taking us. Thank you for what you have been teaching us and what you have been imparting to us through your words. We pray, Father in heaven, that you will open our hearts and our minds and help us to absorb and to embrace what it is that we are learning. This is the Bible. This is the book. This is the word of God. And we are thankful to you. Continue to inspire our hearts, inspire our minds, and help us to grow from strength to strength by virtue of the things that we have learned 
from Bible study. We bless your name, mighty God. Bless your people. Remember them. Hold your children in the hollows of your hands and let your name be glorified. We give you thanks. We bless you, great God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, um, brethren beloved. And I want to remind you at this time that comes this Friday, we will be having, after about three or so years that we have not had any, we will be having a Good Friday service. Uh, we will just have one service on Friday. It begins at 9 a.m. And we invite as many of you as can make it up. We know it's a holiday and so many of our saints are in the country. And so we didn't want to have two services. So we are going to have one service, but we want as much as the place can hold. And once you come, I can assure you, you will not be turned back. If, 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 if too many of us are there, we will make room. You will hold. So we invite you to come out. Uh, for the first Good Friday service in about a couple of years, let's come out and worship the Lord together. Every time we get the opportunity to come, let's come and magnify the Lord and fellowship one with the other. So 9 o'clock, and I can assure you that by the latest minutes to 11, 11 o'clock, you are on your way home. God bless you. Uh, looking forward to see us on Friday. The Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.